Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Doctors Changing Medicine podcast. I have with me here, Dr. Tanya Kaylor, and you are not ready. This is going to be a really great interview. Um, she is a family medicine doc, but she is doing so many things outside of family medicine. And um, you, you're going you're gonna to be blown away. And the thing I love about her is not only has she embraced some of her passions outside of medicine, but she's also changing medicine, right? And you know that I'm all about that. So Dr. Kaler, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm, I'm excited. So I, I want to start off with your family medicine doc. Yes. And, um, you know, how did you move from not move right because you're you're still there but how did you embrace all these other things that you're doing so so talk to us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are now yeah well it's really interesting so after about 16 years into practice and especially as i um started into academic medicine which i love working with residents um uh probably after about eight years of um core faculty i burned out not the way that I would have designed for it to happen, but it all works out because um, I ended up in a private practice with a husband and wife who ran the practice and set it up to enjoy medicine rather than maximize profits. And I healed there. It, it was slow healing, but I healed. And then I knew that there were these things that I was missing. I really love like curricular um, activities and I love teaching and I love um, giving people hope, especially in medicine. And I was, um, I uh, ended up hiring a physician coach, which by the way, that was the, my first introduction to knowing that that was even a thing. And she um, helped me to get clarity about what would be impactful. At the same time she was doing that, she allowed me to be a part of a group of 12 physicians in a group coaching program. And I watched tools that I did not know existed go to work in these physicians' lives to change their departments that they were in, to change their relationships, to um, pivot and shift. And it was just, I never knew that within family medicine, or not all of them were family medicine, but even within primary care, that we actually had more control than we thought. And so the light bulb came on, right? I'm trying to look at all of these things. And I was like, oh, I want to take coaching to my people and that academic family medicine, that's the residents, that's the faculty, um, because they need these tools. Okay. So your story made me all kinds of happy. Um, you know, and, and I think there's something that I don't hear a lot of that you said that I really want to pull out. And then that's that you joined a private practice where their thing was to create for you to have an enjoyable work life over profits. And if they existed, it means they still worked the profit. It's just that the profit didn't lead. And so everyone who's listening, who runs a private practice, that's the challenge that we have now to create our own systems where the doctors, you know, or the other clinicians who work for us, they have some kind of work-life you know, balance or control or harmony, which integration, whatever word you want to, whatever word you want to use. And that they, you know, like they, they find that joy in, in medicine. And it's something that seems a little Herculean because it's not that way for most places, but again, we're changing medicine. And so we can think and we can brainstorm and we can look for things to do to set it up where doctors are not getting burned out on our watch, you know? And then the other statement you made is that even in primary care, we have more control than we know. And that just made me go like, I could do a cartwheel right here, you know, because because we do. Now, there's some things we need to do to step into it, but we do have more control. That is that is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and it's so true. And I think um, faculty specifically, rural, um, they wear so many hats that they often feel out of control, right? And they often feel, or at least the ones that I've been working with coaching and the ones uh, and myself feel like it couldn't ever do any of them as well as we wanted. Right. And then residents also um, really can get into a really uh, um, uh, unhealthy state where they have this learned helplessness almost and helping them reconnect with where they do have agency is such an important thing for them to not just endure, but to thrive. 
Don't endure, thrive. Yeah. Okay. Love it. Now, so you 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 went through the burnout. You went to the private practice. You're like, man, but I'm you know I'm missing out all this stuff. I love teaching residents and all of that. And you're like, I'm gonna take. And then you got coaching, and you're like, I'm gonna take coach coaching to my institution. And so was this embrace? Like, oh, this is what we've been missing. Did you have to get the buy in of other people? Like, how did that process work? Because there's always a process between this is what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna change the world, and here it is. Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, that's a really important thing because um, I, so I went and got coach training. I knew I needed the skill set, right? And so I invested in my own, like, skill set so I could, so I could actually make a difference. And, um, you know, I'm, I, the story I can tell about myself is I'm really good at seeing something and copying it and, and, and massaging it, making it my own, but there was not anybody for me to copy that I was aware of, right? Like as far as I knew, I was the only person coaching in residency programs. Now I have since learned that there are a lot of um, people on the front line who have been doing it from academia um, and doing studies. Um, Dr. Carrie Palomara, for instance. Um, however, at the time I was like, how do I do this? And so um, how it was received is interesting. I had a couple of mentors. Um, one was a chair of a, a very large um, uh, set of residency programs at a university. And he was like the most encouraging. He was like, yes. He said, I have had a professional coach for years. And I was like, what? And then um, I had uh, a couple of other people who were very encouraging and helped me like think through this logically. What is it going to look like? How are you going to find out what what the residencies actually need, because it's easy for me to think. And so there was um, some needs assessments that I, I needed to entertain. Um, I had somebody uh, offer me that now, like my business really started going like right before the pandemic and right after the pandemic, they offered that this probably wasn't a time to try something new, <laughs> but it was the right time for me. Um, and so I, um, talked with the behavioral health team at my residency program. I did not want to be a resident um, coach within when I'm evaluating. So I still remain as on-call faculty there, but I wanted their um, input and they had so many good insights. Um, so that was very helpful. And so I pivoted based on the needs assessment and our feedback. And, um, and then I had, I just put out there what I was trying to do and had one residency program hire me to do both their resident and faculty. And just watching the cultural change, giving them the same tool set, giving them the same language, really elevating the culture that existed there. And then one thing led to another and um, other people began thinking, what can we do? Then I ended up in a, a faculty development um, a longitudinal program for a large university network of residency programs. And so um, I think it's been very well received. I think it's very well hidden and not um, known as a resource. Wow. Okay. So if you are wanting a business masterclass, Dr. Kaler just took you through it. Right. And so, because I, I mean, like your, your journey, you, the idea was there. And then you talk to some people and some were encouraging, some others like, okay, we need to do a needs assessment. You did that because you, you don't help people based on what you think they need. You actually have to find out what they need. Right. And so you did that and pivoted a little bit based on what they said and all that and started talking about it. Right. And started talking about it and someone said yes. And the rest is history as they say. And so that is, that is phenomenal. <laughs> I'm so glad you did that. Um, and, oh, we skipped a step. Um, somebody offered that, maybe not the right time. Or, you know, and there's so many variations of that. Not the thing to do. Who's going to listen to you? Da, 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 da. Like, you're not an entrepreneur. What are you thinking? Um, and I'm glad that you didn't listen to that. Because, <laughs> you know, see all the changes that would not have happened. And so I guess for me, I would I would like to know, and the listeners would like to know, um, walk us through some of the transformations, right? that you've observed after you've gone to a program and you worked with them for however, however long you work with them, the kind of changes that um, people can actually expect. Yeah, I think that's really good. Um, and it, it's really fun to watch. And it's not like, 
you know, every once in a while, I'll have a resident be, say something like, this was the most important hour of my residency training, right? So that is not like the norm, but it's fun when those happen, when they have that light bulb moment. But other times it just is taking some time. And um, I, one of the biggest things, you know, when you mentioned that I listened to the advice but didn't necessarily take that this wasn't the time, that was because I was able to um, tune into my intuition, my gut, right? One of the biggest things that I see helping people transform um, is learning to get back in touch with their knowing. Um, because, you know, or call it your, you know, your inner wisdom, your spirit, whatever it is, because otherwise you're second guessing and spinning and you're having all this negative self-talk. So one of the things is just helping people realize what they're saying to themselves what they're listening to, how they filter that, and then checking in with their own true gut. Because I think we um, systematically get conditioned to stop listening to that inner voice, right? And I think that's one of the most empowering things um, that I know of. Uh, another part is, this is huge, especially from the, from the trainee standpoint, although it still exists in the faculty um, world too, but is this idea of performing, right? It's opening night, we're giving a performance um, and now we're waiting, um, was it a hit smash or was it a total flop, right? Because when we're in performing mode, we are limited to external judgments, right? Um, and that our self-worth gets tied to that. However, when we can shift into being, and becoming, it allows for our own self-reflection, trusting that gut, what do we wanna change? Where do we wanna grow? And it really allows for growth and mastery. So again, all of these things are shifting back control to the individual physician, right? Um, and so I just think that that's some big things. I think, oh, you know, you asked for like some examples and one of my um, favorite examples is um, helping some a physician realize that they were assigning meaning to not just what somebody said, but to a object. In fact, in this person's oh, wow. object, it, it was a clock. Wow. Okay. Tell me about that. <laughs> so as we were coaching, it finally dawned on her that the clock being late, no matter if she was late um, with patient care or staying late after work or taking work home, no matter how she judged it, those numbers on the clock were not just neutral data. They were actually condemnations of her worth. And once she had that realization, then she could start to dismantle and separate out, that's just data. Do I wanna become more efficient? Yes, do I wanna not take work home? Great, what am I gonna do to, to take back agency here. So. And so this is all about getting back control. And, 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 and I think that's a huge part of burnout and the dissatisfaction and all of that is like, I'm a, I'm a cog in the wheel. What I say doesn't matter. I'm no longer in control. And when people get back control, <laughs> that's, that's a very freeing, empowering thing. It really is. Um, now for you, I know this is a mission of yours. And so talk to us about if you had your way, um, what would you do with residency programs? What would residency training look like? How would things be different for residency, maybe faculty as well? Like what's your, what's your dream? Yeah. Okay. So um, I have ideas. Um, and so I am a, I'm the individual boots on the ground one-on-one -on -one person, right? But I have ideas for the people who are systems thinkers, right? And so what I would love to see, number one, is faculty knowing they're valued. There are things that the universities and the community programs can do to really um, impart that they are valuable. As it is, we're all so busy that nobody takes the time to make the extra effort to, you know, give kudos and give recognition. And we're all in it together, right? So one is the faculty need to know they're valued. 
Um, the second is they need to be um, afforded time to do their job. Now, I don't pretend to have all the answers. There are this many jobs from a faculty standpoint. And then there is this many hours in each day. In my clock, it's 24 hours. I don't know about the rest of you, right? <laughs> and so we know there's there's a math problem here, but I do believe there are system thinkers out there that can help leverage faculty time and effort to the most valuable things. And what are we actually trying to do? We are actually trying to train up the next generation of physicians. And so them having the ability to have some control, to model self-care, um, um, and to really connect, because we know connection really um, buffers our, um, buffers our, the way we experience the day-to-day, -day, right? Um, residents, I would love to see um, a way to give residents more um, autonomy, right? And I know that this is, um, you know, I don't want to do this rotation. I don't, I know we have to have standards. And so how within the standards that the ACGME and the ABFM set down, how do we allow residents to have some agency and have some autonomy and still accomplish the mission? Because I kind of feel like we're in the, we've tried that, we've done that, this is the best we can do. And we're like out of ideas. Um, and so I also would love to have all faculty have some basic coach training because there are going to be times as core faculty that you're going to learn to trust when to step into that advisor, mentor, uh, directive role. Um, role, and it'll probably depend on the resident and the situation and the day, but I think all faculty need to have a core skill set of coaching. And then I would love for every residency program to have funds and a system to access an external safe coach, right? Because I am not supervising the either the faculty or the residents that I'm coaching. It's safe. It's confidential within the confines of the mandatory reporting laws, right? And um, I believe that medicine is so challenging, especially right now that that is something that needs to be a priority. We know the data is there, that it improves the quality of life and decreases burnout. And I think we really have to um, uh, decide what our priorities are. And I would love to see coaching be a part of that. That is really well thought out. <laughs> That is that is really thought well, well thought out, and it's you know it, it's systemic and it covers a lot of uh, areas. Of course, you know me, I would like, and and they shall have business training. <laughs> you know, like come on, people, don't don't educate us and not empower us to you know <laughs> do it like we mean it. But now, for those areas, when you look at those different areas, because the the thing about what we're doing with changing medicine is that it's so broad. There's no one person who can change medicine, right? It's just like you identify, like I, I have some thoughts and, you know, there's some people who are system thinkers and, and all of that, you know, we, we don't, no one person can fix it, no matter how powerful they are, you know, that we need the whole Calvary. Um, but we all have our own area, right? That's how the tsunami is, the tsunami of change is created. Everybody has their own one area that like, I'm, this, this is like a bulldog to a, uh, to a bone. I'm not letting go of that. And so in all of these areas, which, which is your, your core mission that you're holding on to? You're like, I'm not letting go until we fix this. You know, even if people are telling you, this is not a good time and you're like, I'm not letting go. Uh, I think having hybrid coaching for our trainees is critical. In the group setting, they can have shared experience. They can know they're not alone. They can shift into um, out of isolation um, and offer support. And in the individual sessions, they can really dig deep and be more vulnerable and lean in to find their own best answers because they are whole, capable, and resourceful. And they do have their own best answers. And a coach can help clear all that stuff out that's blocking them. That's to me, the absolute, my core goal. Love it. Okay. So that, that, that's your heel. And, 
you know, I love that you're already owning it. I, I love that you're already doing it. And, you know, I love, I love encouraging people who've decided that they're going to do something to change this. And I'm like, it, sometimes it looks, you know, like it's small, sometimes it looks like it's big, but it doesn't matter. It's really huge. And the physician community needs it, right? They need all our, all of all, all the things that we do. Um, so how would, how would a listener, so a physician, maybe linked with the, you know, a, a residency program or knows a program director, or maybe the program director is even like, I don't know, you know, my residents are really struggling. I don't know what to do. And the person is listening to this episode like, oh my goodness, you, you need to meet Dr. Kaler. How would a physician listening now support you on your mission? Oh, wow. That's a great question. So there are a couple of things they could do. One is if you know um, family physicians, residents, faculty members, they send them um, my site, you know, my, my website, I have a blog, I put free information out there that people can start using right away. And that's um, on my website, uh, joinfamilymedicine.com. And there's a blog there. The second thing is, um, have them get on a console call with me. So I can tell them what it would look like. What are, what are the, what's the time commitment that I'm asking? How much effort would I be asking of them? And kind of co-creating what would be the best fit for their residency. Um, because it's going to look different for every program. Um, because I really know each program has their own set of, of unique needs. And so they can, uh, there's a, um, link on my website that they could just set up a consult with me and we could talk through those, what that would look like for them. Love it. Okay. So for anyone listening, um, again, we need all hands on deck. And if you're, if you know of a residency program, you're like, oh my goodness, they absolutely need this. Then, then now you know what to do. And then some other people are like, okay, but where do we find her? Where do we find her? Where, where do they go to find you doc? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm on Facebook as joy and family medicine coaching. Um, I'm on LinkedIn at Tanya Kaler, MD, and, um, and then my website has my blog as well. So www.joyandfamilymedicine.com. There you go, people. So find her, follow her. Okay. Now I talk about the Doctors Changing Medicine podcast being more than a podcast is more like a movement. And, you know, there's a million of us. If we don't like things, we can change things, but it will take all of us. Right. And so I tell everyone listening, you have to share this episode with the doctors in your life. You should listen to it. It's really great. It's really inspiring. You're going to get a lot of nuggets from it, but I want you to share this with, you know, the doctors in your life. And so what would you say is the reason why a doctor listening right now needs to share this episode with the docs they know? Um, I'll tell you why. Number one, uh, each physician needs to know that they are whole. They are wholly worthy and they have value right now. And they need to know that. And they need to know that they can decrease um, unnecessary suffering. They can uh, restore and protect their energy at physical, mental, emotional, and that they can actually start to move towards the ideal life that they want, where they, the reason they went into medicine to begin with, we can start to move closer to that. Every physician deserves to know that. Every physician deserves to know. So tell all the doctors, you know, Dr. Kaler, thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your miss mission. I love your mission. I love what you do. And, um, you know, you're doing your part to be the change in medicine, especially with the residents, you know, and so I, I truly appreciate that. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, Dr. Una, for having me. Absolutely. All right, people, share the episode, and I will see you on the next episode of the Doctors Changing Medicine podcast.